Hello everyone, my name is Ozimitsu and welcome back to my channel. Today is my birthday and I wanted to do a special list to mark my 25th birthday. Oh god, I'm so old. Pokemon has played a huge role in my life and it's safe to say it is one of my favourite video game franchises of all time. Over the years I've developed several strong opinions about various aspects of the game and one of the most difficult questions I get asked on a daily basis by my viewers is what my definitive top 10 favourite Pokemon list would look like. No limitations, no boundaries, no restrictions in terms of their base stat totals or their competitive usefulness. Just my favourites, be that because I love its design, enjoy using it in game or just have some sort of sentimental attachment to it. And as a long term die hard Pokemon fan this list was incredibly difficult mainly because I struggled narrowing down my top 10 favourites from a selection of over 800 pocket monsters but I finally was able to decide on which Pokemon would make the cut. So today I'm going to be talking you through my top 10 favourite Pokemon of all time. So with all of that out the way let's get this countdown underway. Let's go! Murkrow, confused would-be attackers by luring them into dark mountain trails where they are sure to get lost. Murkrow. Murkrow. Murkrow! <laughs> Surprisingly, I didn't think too much of Murkrow when growing up. In fact, I only started liking Murkrow upon playing my first playthrough of Pokemon Moon. When Pokemon Sun and Moon were released, my friend Carl and I were sat in a Skype call. Skype's such a dead meme. And he suggested the idea of me recording a 6v6 battle using unevolved Pokemon with Evilite against their evolutionary counterparts as a nod to my ongoing Evolution Solution series. <coughs> Shameless plug. But because at this stage Pokemon Bank wasn't out, we were limited to which Pokemon we could use. One of the Pokemon I used for this video in the end was Murkrow. So I sat there plotting on Showdown what kind of set I wanted to run before breeding it. Breeding. Its prank stability was just too good not to make use of. Ever since I bred, Eevee trained and started battling with Murkrow and came up with a typical Aussie set, I had so much fun using it. Eventually I grew a strong attachment to this little dark crow. I find it amusing whenever I FFA with my friends who are all using intimidating looking Pokemon but they all feel obliged to attack my Murkrow before I run a mean look slash Purisong setup. I find its design pretty clever, I like that its beak resembles a witch's nose as well as its head being shaped like a witch his hat, which makes this Pokemon all that more appealing to me. Grouping all these factors together has made me have such a strong fondness to this little crow and it will always have a special place in my heart. Emolga, the sky squirrel Pokemon. Emolga lives in trees and uses its cape-like membrane to glide through the air. Emolga, where do I begin with Emolga? Oh my goodness its anime cry is just so kawaii. Oh. As many followers of this channel will be aware, I'm a massive Gen 5 fanboy. It was a generation that brought me back into Pokemon after skipping Gen 4. And the main thing that reeled me back in was the black and white anime. I know many people disliked the Unova anime, but I don't care, I liked it. When Ash and his friends came across an Emolga in her debut, Emolga the Irresistible, it was as though Emolga's attract had worked on me. I loved it. I loved how she was so sassy, playful, and was, pardon the pun, such a prankster. And it being a Pika clone added to its appeal. As the episode was drawing to a close, I was watching it kind of upset thinking we'd never see Emolga again. But to my excitement, we see Emolga glide into Iris's arms, hinting at wanting to travel with her. I was overjoyed when Iris caught Emolga, as it meant it wasn't the last we saw of her. Not only this, one of the first shinies I caught in Sun and Moon was an Emolga. It was challenging due to Emolga in SOS battles, using this charge meaning it could hit all Pokemon on the field, and if I had used Fault Swipe, it risked killing the other Pokemon, breaking my chain. I was fortunate enough to eventually catch one with a jolly nature and four perfect IVs. I occasionally use it in battle to troll on the battle spot and I've had a lot of fun with it. Whenever I think of Emolga I feel happy, I associate it with such positive emotions and for those reasons I've placed Emolga at number 9 on my list. Orocorio. I like all of the forms of Orocorio, but the one I have an extra sweet spot for is a yellow nectar, otherwise known as Orocorio Pom Pom style. When the hype for Sun and Moon was building up, one of the earlier Pokemon to be announced were the Orocorio forms, and honestly, I didn't really think too much of any of them. It was only until my first playthrough I encountered the Pom Pom style Orocorio. I found its in game cry very cute, and its design is very appealing, mainly because yellow is my favourite colour. I can't really articulate 
why I love Aurukoria so much, but I really really do. I like that it's the cheerleader Pokemon cheering you on. Whenever I had Aurukoria on my team and it would win battles against Totem Pokemon, the way it would turn around and do its little dancing animation, I just found it so adorable. I also find it cute how it is known to cheer up its trainers when they're feeling glum by dancing. Say what you want about Aurukoria, I find it so cute and it's definitely made me smile, especially when I was feeling down. It's there for me, cheering me on. Garchomp. This selection may seem out of place because it's the first Pokemon that isn't really considered cute by any standards. Echoing my previous sentiments, I skipped Generation 4, which meant I didn't even know Garchomp had existed. I first discovered Garchomp when Cynthia battled with it in the black and white anime, and I first thought, wow, that's a sleek looking Pokemon. I love its colour scheme, its design is very appealing. I really like the patch of gold yellow colouring underneath its red belly area. I know that seems like a strange comment to make, but it really does make me like its design even more. Garchomp horn-like appendages that sort of resemble a plane really gives off a hammerhead shark vibe and sharks are awesome. It sort of reminds me of Captain Gantu from Lilo and Stitch and I loved the movie and the animated series as a kid. Not only this, I've had a lot of fun running Garchomp in many different ways in competitive battling, especially in double battles where I pair it with Togekiss who spams follow me whilst I earthquake, destroying everything in its path. It doesn't surprise me at all why Garchomp is so popular, its sleek design, its competitive usefulness, its appearances in the anime, and the way it's depicted as a menacing dragon really does add to its appeal. Gothitelle, the astral body Pokémon. Gothitelle's psychic power is so great that it is said to warp space around it and distort reality in the process. Gothitelle, yes another Pokémon from the fifth generation. What can I say, I have a special attachment to the Unova region. The reason I love Gothitelle so much has a bit more of a personal reasoning to it. The way I was reeled back into playing Pokemon again was primarily due to the black and white anime, as mentioned earlier. I remember watching the anime when it was about a year old in 2012. In 2012 I was really unwell. I was so sick, I felt really weak and was unable to move some days. I used to lie on the sofa with the TV on for background noise, whilst I used to think about all of my troubles. I used to miss my life as a kid, a time when things were simple. A time when I was happier. Anyway, the episode that caught my eye was The Lost World of Gothitelle, which starts with Ash and friends wanting to cross the Sky Arrow Bridge to travel to Castilia City. When they attempt to cross it, they are stopped by a very angry looking Gothitelle. After this, it seems Ash and his friends have been transported to what appears to be the same place, only the bridge hasn't been constructed yet. The TLDR, it was discovered that Ash and friends were trapped in Gothitelle's memories, where she enjoyed spending time with a young girl named Sally. They enjoyed spending their day meeting new people, selling tickets on Sally's father's water taxi, which was revealed to be going out of business. The water taxi business closing down meant Sally and Gothitelle could no longer spend as much time together, which was made worse when Sally left for college to become a Pokemon doctor, and many years later Gothitelle mysteriously disappeared. Gothitelle's times with Sally were the dearest and most cherished moments she had, and although her memories didn't seem like much to some, they were very special to Gothitelle. Gothitelle would do anything to protect her memories, which is why she was so determined to stop Ash and friends from crossing the Sky Arrow Bridge. This really hit home with me as I have so many special memories growing up, spending time with loved ones who are no longer with me. Without going into too much detail, as I grew older, I felt lonelier and became more depressed. I used to always wish to go back in time, before I was suffering from depression, before I had so many health problems and troubles in general. But watching this episode showed me not even the psychic type Gothitelle could turn back the hands of time, no matter how many times she trapped people in her memories. And because I could relate to this sentiment on such a personal level, I associated this with Gothitelle. As stupid as it sounds, Gothitelle has gotten me through some very dark times, and even if my memories didn't seem like much to an outsider, they were memories I hold close to my heart. Gothitelle is a reminder of that, which is why why I have such a sentimental attachment to this Pokemon. Lilligant, the flowering Pokemon. The beautiful flower on Lilligant's head gives off a relaxing fragrance, although getting it to bloom can be difficult even for a veteran trainer. Lilligant. Yes, another Unova Pokemon. Again, this one has a bit of a backstory that I've previously shared on my top 5 female Pokemon list. Oh for God's sake, don't watch it, it's freaking awful. Anyway, growing up one of my friends and I were fascinated by a certain species of flowers. We used to take pictures of all different kinds of flowers we hadn't seen before and keep them in a folder. Because I didn't have a room of my own, I simply didn't have the space to keep a folder in my shared room, so my friend used to keep it at their house. As the years went on, we kind of drifted apart, which was made worse when they moved away. 
Growing up I didn't really have many friends, mainly because I was made fun of for liking things like Pokemon and showing an interest in things that the other kids didn't think were cool enough. When playing through Pokemon White many years later I encountered a Petalil, which I soon after evolved into a beautiful Lilligant, and all those memories came rushing back to me. Lilies are one of my favourite flowers, which Lilligant appears to be based on, which makes its design more appealing to me. Whenever I see Lilligan, I get reminded of all the fun times I had with my friend going on fake adventures, taking pictures of various kind of flowers, as it just made us so happy. I've also tried using Lilligan competitively, but unfortunately with very little success. However, I had a lot of fun training it, and it was actually quite useful in my first playthrough of the 5th generation games. With access to moves like Quiver Dance and Petal Dance, coupled with its own tempo ability, makes Lilligan a pretty fun Pokemon to use in battle. But taking its competitive usefulness out of the question, I really like Lilligant because of its sentimental value to me, and it will always be one of my favourite Pokemon of all time. Rosefray, the bouquet Pokemon. Rosefray is the evolved form of Roselia. It lures enemies with its sweet aroma that attacks with dancer-like elegance. Rosefray. I first saw Rosefray in the black and white anime in the episode Beauties Battling for Pride and Prestige. And when I first saw it, I thought... You're beautiful. You're beautiful. As you can probably tell, I love Pokemon designs based off flowers. I don't really know why, they're just really appealing to me. Rose Raid, in my opinion, has one of the best designs. I love how it looks like it's wearing a cape, as well as its hands being made up of a bouquet of roses, and the whole masquerade theme being the bare bones of its design. Shiny Rose Raid has got to be one of the most beautiful shinies I have ever laid my eyes on. I also love Rose Raid due to the success I've had with it in competitive battling. I'm really fickle when it comes to coming up with movesets, so I run a few different Rose Raid sets, some with a natural cure ability, and I love surprising people by running Dazzling Gleam, but I've also had a lot of success running it with its technician ability. I was lucky enough to breed one with its hidden power being Rock, which for a grass type is amazing considering it covers its fire, flying and ice weaknesses, and Magical Leaf boosted by technician is pretty awesome because it never misses. Pop an assault vest on it coupled with its monstrous special attack, special defense and decent speed stat means this thing is a bulky special sweeper. I've also recently been trying a rain team and you can bet I run Rose Raid on it due to it getting access to Weather Ball holding the Namalium Z, meaning it will use a water type Z move. Rose Raid's versatility in battle is just amazing and due to this it is one of my favorite Pokemon. Spritzy. Spritzy and its evolution Aromatis are one of my favourite Pokemon of all time. I know, I know, you're probably going to be slamming your keyboard thinking, oh my god, how can you like Aromatis? Put your keyboard away and let me tell you why your opinion is wrong. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love Aromatis due to the amount of success I've had using it in X and Y and even my Auras competitive team, as it's simply amazing on the Trick Room. I used to love setting up Trick Room and disabling any super effective hits I would be able to tank on the first turn. It was a pretty good deal screener as it cannot be taunted due to its Aroma availability, but I've placed Spritzy at number 3 on this list as I prefer it a little bit more. In my opinion, Spritzy is one of the most adorable and cutest Pokemon to ever exist. I never initially thought too much of it until I watched the episode Fairy Type Trickery in which Ash battles Valerie for his next gym badge. Valerie's Spritzy was so adorable and the way it battled was incredible. Despite the episode being full of anime logic, it didn't take away from the episode too much. In fact, watching Valerie Spritzy battle the way it did actually inspired me to breed one of my own. After I tried so hard breeding one with the best IVs and nature, I grew so attached to it that it quickly became one of my favourite Pokemon. Heck, my current Evolution Solution series was started all by me analysing Evilite, Spritzy and Aromatisse, and I feel this series helped my channel grow the way that it did, and I have Spritzy to thank for that. Spritzy, you're awesome. Never change. Clefairy. I can't really articulate why I love Clefairy so much, but I really really do. And for a very long time it was actually my favourite Pokemon. At the time of making my YouTube channel, I was considering making Clefairy my channel mascot as I felt it would represent me really well. I love fairy types, Clefairy is kind of the fairy type mascot, and it's cute! When I was growing up, as a younger sibling, I never really had control of what we'd watch on TV. I promise you I'm going somewhere with this. So my older brother always got to choose what we watched. I remember one afternoon, he had cricket practice, so I took this opportunity to record something I'd enjoy on one of those cassette tapes. <laughs> 
so ancient. I'd never seen the anime before, but the episode I turned on happened to be the episode called Clefairy Tales. It's funny looking back at it because I didn't tune in until the near end of the episode and recorded around the last 10 minutes of it. I used to take the tape into my mom's room that had a TV that wasn't hooked up to the cable at the time and I watched what I managed to record several times and the Pokemon that stuck out was obviously Clefairy. It was funny watching Clefairy and Jigglypuff fight each other, it's quite possible the most adorable battle ever. I just had fond memories of Clefairy as it was the episode that introduced me to the franchise. Ever since, I have become a massive Poké fan. Clefairy will always be the Pokémon I think of whenever I get asked what got me into liking Pokémon. And its cry is just painfully cute, I just can't even! Oshawott, the sea otter Pokémon. Oshawott attacks and defends using the scout chop that can be removed from its stomach. At number one today, there's no surprises on this list, it's Oshawott. I wish I could have been more interesting or had some sort of surprising number one entry, but it's not, it's Oshawott. Oshawott is my favourite Pokemon, hence why I decided on making it my channel mascot. It's adorable, I love its design, its colour scheme is very very appealing, how can anyone not think Oshawott is cute? As I mentioned before, I'm a massive Gen 5 fanboy, and the main thing that reeled me back into Pokemon was the black and white anime. Seeing Ash's Oshawott in the anime was so unbearably cute. I used to love how it would come out of its Pokeball so confidently. A lot of people found Oshawa annoying, but I didn't. I love its personality, it really added to its appeal, and made the anime that bit more enjoyable for me. I knew once finishing the black and white anime when I'd start playing the Gen 5 games, I'd pick up an Oshawa as my starter, and you can bet that is exactly what I did. Travelling through Unova with the cute little sea otter by my side was an absolute pleasure, and I wouldn't change the experiences I had playing the Gen 5 games and watching the black and white anime for the world. So there you have it, those are my top 10 favourite Pokemon of all time. Of course this list could change in the future, and if I feel my favourites list drastically changes, I might make an updated list someday. I I know my favourites list isn't the most interesting, but it isn't supposed to be. However, I hope you did enjoy this video, and if you did, be sure to leave this video a big thumbs up, as that really does help me out, as well as subscribing to my channel so you never miss a video from me. And with all of that being said, I hope to see you guys very soon.